Well, we're here talking about anti-Semitism today. It's not just the world's oldest hatred, it's the world's oldest spiritual issue. These are themes that have accompanied Jews since Roman times. What happens is the Jew is what we call the classic other. He's not us, he's somebody different. These waves of hatred, violence, persecution, being alienated from society. Antisemitism has had different faces along the years, but today you can call it anti-Zionism that a lot of times takes a face of antisemitism. There's like a blinder to people's eyes, which I think is spiritual. I think God wants to reveal it to people. Let me tell you a story. My grandfather was a businessman who did business in South of France. One day, going out from the post office, he was arrested. He was taken to Paris, from Paris to Dachau, from Dachau to Auschwitz, and he died in Auschwitz. The only reason he was arrested was because he was a Jew. You see, hating the Jewish people is hating the plan of God. God has elected a nation he took the people of Israel out of Egypt, made them into a nation for a purpose that he will use them to be a light for the world. Through them, he'll bring the plan of salvation. And there's no doubt that the devil wants to stop that plan. And to you, our brothers and sisters who loves and support Israel, I just want to say, Toda Rabba, thank you and thank you and keep praying for the peace of Jerusalem. Persecution, violence, and even genocide have been part of the Jewish experience in the diaspora. The modern state of Israel itself cannot be understood without the context of anti-Semitism. And today we want you to understand that anti-Semitism has played a huge role in the development of the Jewish culture and the Jewish people. And even today, anti-Semitism persists and exists. And a huge game changer in this phenomenon worldwide was the establishment of the modern state of Israel. Anti-Semitism is a range of things, from an attitude that just says, I don't like Jews very much, to an attitude that says they're their biggest problem and we have to deal with them. It hasn't gone away, and a lot of people feel like it did. Regardless of how far removed we think the events of the Holocaust are, more than 70 years later, anti-Semitism is still deeply rooted in many countries. In order to understand the Jewish people, you have to learn. And we have to learn in order to prevent it happening in the future. And for people of faith and believe in Jesus the Messiah, the church's history is a part of your history. And part of that church history, unfortunately, is a long, long list of anti-Jewish sentiment, of violence. And what we don't realize is the church's history is buried, but it's a lie. There's no doubt that the existence and strength of the State of Israel provides one of the most powerful solutions to stopping anti-Semitism. Shalom, Igal. Hey, Mati, shalom. Good to see you. Good to see you, too. Before we had a state of our own, there was a governing body representing the Jews called the Jewish Agency. Established in 1929, the Jewish Agency was basically the Israeli government before such a thing existed. To this day, it remains an integral part of Zionism and Jewish life, by facilitating immigration to Israel, connecting Jewish communities worldwide, and helping vulnerable communities both within and outside of the country. I spoke with Igal Palmo from the Jewish Agency to better understand Israel's commitment to Jewish communities abroad. In the German town of Halle, during the Yom Kippur service, a white supremacist armed to his teeth tried to penetrate into a synagogue which was full to capacity. You would think that having our own country with a strong army and global influence would make anti-Semitism all but disappear. But it turns out that the fight's not over yet. Thanks to the surveillance cameras, the guards saw that person had a submachine gun. So he had shut all the entryways to the synagogue, including the main door, which was an armor door that we have installed. When the terrorist reached the door, he tried to break in by firing at the door a few rounds and didn't even manage to, to shatter it. Tried to look for another entry. Everything was shut down hermetically, so he went away. Unfortunately, he killed two passerbys, but we have prevented a huge massacre inside the synagogue. 
thanks to the defense system. Anti-Semitic attacks like this are happening at an alarming rate all over the world. The Jewish agency provides Jews still living in exile with the necessary funding to build security infrastructure and protect themselves. Just like at the synagogue in Halle, these efforts are saving lives. So you, you take real action to protect Jewish communities around yes. the world. Uh, Jews have been living outside the land of Israel for millennia. So the total number of Jews is around 14 to 15 million. And, and out of those, six and a half in Israel. Six and a half in Israel and six and a half in North America. Mm -hmm. The rest are spread through uh, Western Europe, Eastern Europe and Russia, Latin America mostly, South Africa and Australia and New Zealand. So we reach out to other communities who live in diasporas. We work with foreign governments on matters regarding Jewish communities and legislation, uh, anti-Semitism, uh, education, and so on. In order to combat effectively anti-Semitism in the long run, there needs to be a very engaged effort in education by all governments and institutions around the world. This is necessary because we as Jews are very much aware of anti-Semitism when we face it. But not everyone is aware of what it really is and how it expresses itself. We're on our way to Yad Vashem, which is the Israeli National Holocaust Remembrance Center. But today we're going to talk to them about anti-Semitism and specifically how they're working to educate communities worldwide about the importance of understanding the history and the roots of anti-Semitism. The Holocaust serves as the culminating event in modern anti-Semitism, a systematic attempt to wipe out the Jewish people from the face of the earth. Six million Jews were killed. That number is hard to even grasp. Israel founded Yad Vashem in 1956 to educate the world about the Holocaust, to ensure that we will never forget it and to make sure it never happens again. I want to go back to get an understanding of how this phenomenon looked and felt throughout history. The truth is that you can go back to understanding anti-Jewish attitudes mm -hmm. all the way back to the Greco-Roman world. Mm -hmm. Because the way the Greeks and the Romans were, because they, they incorporated the new pagan religions, like mm -hmm. they all took them all in and gave them theirs. The Jews didn't do that, obviously, because the Jews wouldn't accept pagan religions. So they're already different. And as Jesus comes on the scene, right, Christianity will grow out of Judaism. And there's two very important anti-Jewish attitudes that grow out of that. One, of course, is blaming the Jews for killing Jesus. And the other thing is the idea that the Jews were God's chosen people, and now we are the new chosen people. And because they screwed up, they also need to be punished. So by the medieval world, the Jews are outside, and the Jews fulfill certain jobs in that society that the Christian feudal society thinks they can't do. They're not moral, like lending money where the Jews become the collectors of the taxes for the lords and the aristocrats because Jews know how to read and write because they learn Hebrew to pray and so they can keep records. And then you get mad at the Jew, you have to pay back the money. So Jews are greedy, right? So you have these stereotypes that grow out in the period. The Jews are always seen as the opposite of the good. But what happens in the 19th century is there's a lot of changes in the world. There's the beginning of the nation state, of mm -hmm. nationalism, there's an industrialization, mm -hmm. urbanization, moving to cities. Who's part of the nation? What is the heart of the nation? Jews are, are, again, they're not part of this. They're outside of it again. So they're seen as not being part of the nation. They're seen as that classic other. And you can explain it in pseudoscientific terms of race. Because our nation is composed of people of our race, right? The Jews are who they are because of their racial component. Combining, let's call it the, the historical anti-Semitism with scientific application of anti-Semitism, along with nationalism, they make this, this perfect kind of storm of anti-Semitism that culminates in the events of the, of the mid-20th century. So the Holocaust was the attempt by the Nazis and then those who became their partners to deal with what we can call the Jewish problem, which they saw as this racial issue. And the policy of the final solution said that all Jews have to be killed. Ultimately, the Nazis, because of these policies, murdered close to six million Jews. Sustaining the memory is very much part of the purpose of Yad Vashem. If the memory is imbued with meaning, which means knowledge and information and the stories of human beings, then that memory has much more traction. Mm -hmm. And it's going to uphold for much longer. 
Yad Vashem is doing its part to help the world understand the roots and causes of anti-Semitism. All the trees on the mountain, about 2,000 trees, mm. are in honor of these righteous among the nations. I met with Sarah Granitsa to talk about how Yad Vashem honors the Christians and other non-Jews who went to great lengths to protect Jewish people when that was an extremely dangerous thing to do. The righteous among the nations are non-Jews who helped save Jews during the Holocaust. The State of Israel acknowledges them. Today we have some uh, 27,000 wow. righteous among the nations, and we continue recognizing, even though most of them are not alive anymore, but when we do receive information, there's a committee headed by a Supreme Court justice. We do our research. One of the first trees in the avenue of the righteous among the nations is Oscar Schindler, the Schindler's List. We also have here the tree of Corrie ten Boom. They are like beacons of light in that dark time of, for humanity. Many Christians might not know that for the average Jew, Christianity is something to fear and even loathe at times. And if you look at the history books, it's not really hard to understand where this sentiment comes from. The righteous among the nations would be the exception to this rule, but today God is doing something new in the world. Today, Christians are becoming some of the best friends of the Jewish people worldwide, and the people in Israel are paying attention to this change. Gateway Church is a Texas multi-campus church that takes their commitment to Israel very seriously. So it says, the Lord, I will honor and praise your name for you are my God. I spoke to Nick Lesmeister. Hold on. Hey, Nick. The director of Gateway Center for Israel. Hey, Monty. Good to see you. To discuss the significance and the reasons behind Christians' support for Israel and the Jewish people. We're here talking about anti-Semitism today. You know, you're living in the U.S., in the Christian world. What, what is your take on anti-Semitism? Well, I, I mean, we're concerned. Uh, number one, because we see it rising. It seems like it seeps into places that people don't know that it's there. And I mean, I had my own experience of this when I was uh, in my early 20s. Uh, the Lord really specifically actually told me I had anti-Semitism in my heart. I said, whoa, I don't hate anybody. And the Lord immediately took me back to a memory that I had when I was a young boy walking with my dad to Catholic Church. And I asked my dad, what, what happened to the Jewish people? I think I was studying the Holocaust at school. And he just quickly and matter-of-factly told me, Catholics are the new Jews. And so he was, you know, under the working, you know, definition of replacement theology. You know, the Catholic Church replaced the Jewish people. And so I think you can absolutely be a Christian and have anti-Semitism in your heart. I, th I think that a bigger question needs to be asked is how did this sentiment end up in the evangelical world? Because th the evangelical claim to fame, quote unquote, would be that we're shed the, the baggage of, of the historical church. So yeah, we would say, we believe everything the Bible says, which is true. The problem is that most of us don't realize the constructs for how we understand scripture go back into the structure of our theology, the idea that the church has replaced Israel. It's been the working theology of the Christian church, you know, since about the three or four hundreds. You become used to it. You know, and I think the average Christian doesn't even realize it's there. That's why there has to be an active response to say, I am going to start investigating this. You know, you, Nick, and like the Gateway Church in general are sort of the, the forerunners on loving Israel in, in the evangelical Christian world. But also when it comes to teaching and like understanding the concepts behind why, I, I want to dial in a bit on, on what that looks like specifically. Well, we think that every church needs to Ask the Lord what that looks like for them. Just start with praying. Start with that. Because I think when you start to pray, you're engaging with God's heart. You're opening yourself up for the Holy Spirit to lead you, and He can show you what steps to take. Beyond that, we, you need to make it a part of your culture. And that's what we've done at Gateway. We've just done it as the Lord has led. I think when you boil it down, if you love Jesus, you love the God of Israel, then you have to be about loving the things that God loves. This is the, the purpose of our lives as followers of Jesus is to orient ourselves to become like Him and to be an expression of Him on the earth. Christians have gone from one of the biggest enemies of the Jewish people to their closest friends and allies. As the spiritual blinders are lifted more and more, we, the people of faith, become the hands and feet of God's plan to draw the entire world unto Himself. When we're talking about fighting anti-Semitism, education is really the key for the long-term fight. You need to make people aware and cognizant of what anti-Semitism really is, mm -hmm. 
how it manifests itself. Our responsibility is the Christians and the Jews together. We can prevent the next catastrophe. A healthy theology of Israel, I believe, leads to healthy churches, leads to healthy Christians, <laughs> leads to healthy societies more than anything. I took a trip to Tel Aviv to meet Nitzana Dalshan Leitner, who has built a career out of saving Jewish lives by combating terrorism against Israel. And she does this in a very profound and extremely effective way through the legal system. You've been spending a lot of time, several decades, fighting for people that have been hurt by terrorism. And you founded an organization, Shurat Adin. Yeah, so it was in the beginning of the Intifada. It was the year of 2000. We all were experiencing another wave of terrorism. I finished law school, and with the rest of the people in Israel, I saw pictures of Palestinian policemen throwing a body of Israeli soldier from a second floor in the Palestinian Authority police station in Ramallah to the angry crowd. And I realized that in any other country in the world, the police and the state would be found responsible for this horrible injury, and they will have to pay a lot of money for the victim. I thought that the, the uh, Palestinian Authority should not be an exception. I went and filed the lawsuits, and then I filed more and more lawsuits against the Palestinian Authority to the extent that it became uh, a life work. We realized that money is the oxygen to terrorism, and if you can stop the flow of the money, perhaps you can stop the flow of the terrorism. And we just started filing lawsuits against Hamas, Islamic Jihad, Hezbollah, the Palestinian Authority against Iran, Syria, which funded the terror organizations. So you what, you're going after a branch of a bank in a different country, and you're saying this bank, we have proof that they funneled money, knowing that it was gonna end up in the hands of a terrorist organization. Right. And then you do what? You take that money from them? Uh, I litigated lawsuits against them on behalf of terror victims that were killed or injured in an attack that this bank supported the terror organization which is responsible for the attack. No bank wants to be recognized as a bank that support terror organization. Mm -hmm. Such a bank will not be able to operate in the United States anymore, for instance. So they settled the case out of court and they pay the victims. The path to justice is endless and filled with tedious legal work that can go on for years. But for Nitsana, it's worth every minute if she can help stop just one more attack. Jonathan Bauer was seven years old. He was uh, walking with his father in the street of Jerusalem, in Jaffa Street. Suddenly, a big, wide-shouldered man walked towards them. What they didn't know back then was that that man was a Palestinian policeman and they had explosive vests and nuts and bolts and screws, as many as he could carry. And then the man looked at Jonathan's eyes and blew himself up. Seven-year-old boy. Seven-year-old boy. Today, Jonathan walks. He doesn't walk like we do. He talks. He doesn't talk like we do. He's disabled for life. That's a case that we filed against the Palestinian Authority because the guy was a Palestinian policeman. He's our employee. And uh, the Palestinian Authority came and said uh, he was our employee, but he was a rogue employee. He did the attack after work hours, but they lost. They lost because the same terrorist now sits in jail in Israel and keeps receiving his salary from the Palestinian Authority. It's so clear that they're okay with it. So this is not a rogue operation. This is not a rogue employee. You don't keep paying a salary to the one that you supposedly consider to be rogue. Our message to the entire world that still want to destroy us is that now there is a price for Jewish blood, that nobody can kill Jews and go without pay. And we will fight. We will fight. We will fight for the state of Israel. We will fight for the Jewish community. And do you know what? In the end, Israel will prevail and the entire Jews in the world. Shalom. With us today, we have a very special guest, Mr. Nathan Shiransky, who spent nine years in the Soviet Union jail, nine years in the Israeli government as a Knesset member and a minister, and nine years as the head of the Jewish agency 
in Israel. Shalom, Mr. Nathan Shiransky. Great, great honor having you with us. Thank you for inviting me. You have a real story. Can you tell us some stories of your station in your life? Well, my first station is the life of a loyal Soviet citizen. It was a life without freedom and life without identity mm -hmm. because I knew that I am Jew only because it is written in the idea of your parents, the word Jew. We are deprived of anything Jewish, whether it is holidays, whether it is language, whether it is faith. The only Jewish thing is anti-Semitism. A lot of anti-Semitism in the street. Second part of my life, when Israel entered our life in 1967, and that's when I started reading really in the underground. What the age tourists. was it? Uh, it's 1967, I'm 19 years old, and I started reading about uh, in fact, about myself, about history. So you had a search of identity. Yeah, uh, that's when I start looking for this, and discover, realize that your history will be not the history of Bolshevik communist revolution with all these awful things which happened. Your history is 3,000 years old. It starts mm -hmm. from the leaving of Exodus from Egypt. Mm -hmm. And it can continue until this day. And that's what gave me strength to fight for my rights, for rights of other Jews, and then for, for freedom. That's how he became spokesman of Jewish movement and human rights movement in the Soviet Union, making sure that the free world knows about what's happening uh, with the Jews. In the end, KGB arrested me, but I'm accused of high treason and being American spy. Uh, what means that they explained me immediately, you, you will be sentenced to death. Wow. The Soviet Union fell after they opened the gates because the Soviet Union could not exist without Iron Curtain. So I was the first political prisoner whom Gorbachev released in 1986. So you mentioned about anti-Semitism in the former Soviet Union. What do you think about anti-Semitism today? The, the hatred towards Israel uh, takes very often uh, the form of, of the same hatred towards Jews. But when it turns to demonization of Israel, or clear double standard. That's exactly what anti-Semites were doing for thousands of years, demonizing Jews, applying different laws to Jews. That is anti-Semitism today. And we have a lot of anti-Semitism I can tell you, Mr. Sharansky, that our station, yeah. TBN, is not only standing against anti-Semitism, is fighting against anti-Semitism, our viewers are probably the best friends Israel have around the world. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Now, we, I appreciate what... very much the solidarity of uh, uh, Christians with our struggle. is was very important when I was in Soviet prison, but it's also very important today when we are really struggling for the right of Israel to be mm -hmm. a legitimate state among the nations. Amen. Yeah. The return of the Jewish people, it's God's plan. Great honor having you with us, Mr. Nathan Shiransky. Really a great honor. was very interesting. And to you, our friends, once again, stay with us for another insight, Israel and the Middle East. Thank you for joining us as we provide a spiritual insight of what God is doing in Israel and in the Middle East. If you want to learn more about what God is doing in Israel, make sure to visit us on our webpage and follow us on social media. Shalom and God bless you for Jerusalem.